More than 100,000 Royal Mail postal workers have gone on strike in a dispute over pay. We're in an unprecedented moment in British politics. For the first time in 40 years, we're having a significant burst of inflation. Workers at the country's largest container shipping port, Felixstowe, have joined the list of those on strike. For more Prices are rising by something like 10%, 12%, 13% a year. Barristers have been taking action for over a month, escalating now with a vote for all-out action. And we've been through something like 15 years of repeated squeezes on people's wages. It's the biggest train strike in over three decades. And into this moment, trade unions only have this huge central significance. At the forefront of the strike sweeping across Britain is the Rail, Maritime and Transport Union, the RMT. In June, its members walked out for the sixth time this year over pay and planned job cuts. For three days, much of the country's metro and rail network was at a standstill. And in the news coverage, the RMT was feeling the heat. For a lot of our viewers, you are the face of the stress, the disruption that they're gonna face. But when the union's leader, Mick Lynch, hit the TV studios, the tables began to turn. Mick Lynch is someone who is prepared to take on the media in a way that, that we don't often see. However much the journalists try to attack him, he can stand up to it. Are you or are you not a Marxist? Because if you are a Marxist, then you're into revolution and into bringing down capitalism. <laughs> Richard, you do come up with the most remarkable twaddle sometimes. His technique is very much to question the questioner. Does it look like the minor strike? <laughs> What no, are it you doesn't, Mr. Lynch, and I'm just asking, I'm just to clarify, I'm just trying to clarify. It's very rare for a trade union leader um, to be able to stand up to media pressure. The way a TV interview used to go with a trade union leader is a trade union leader would turn up in the studio and would basically be bullied by a TV presenter. You see the marginalised role of trade unions in many areas of life. You're a dinosaur. Well, you know, at the end of the day, uh, that was around for a long while. You watch Mick Lynch do a TV interview. The TV presenter might have one or two facts. And Mick Lynch knows the book on, on, on his own dispute. But, interestingly, what he's doing is he's talking directly past the interviewer to the public. Because people can't take it anymore. We've got people who are, who are doing full-time jobs who are having to take state benefits and use food banks. That is a national disgrace. He's making clear that the dispute has got something to do with everyone sat at home watching this interview. It's the sort of message that really has struck a chord because, because of inflation, there are a lot of frightened people in this country and they see at last, here's a union leader who can stand up for them in the media and they like it. By the time the rail strike was ending and Mick Lynch was done sparring with the media, Something highly unusual had happened. Public opinion had swung behind the RMT. But it wasn't enough to force the government and the rail companies it owns to offer a deal. Industrial disputes take time, and in the past, hostile news coverage has helped to break strikes much larger than the RMTs. Good evening. A critical week for the miners' strike. Will it flare up into an all-out war between the unions and the government? Or will it fizzle out? As In the 1980s, the Conservative Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, privatised British industries and took on trade unions that stood in her way. The coal miners' union, led by Arthur Scargill, was among the largest and most militant. And when they went on strike, Thatcher made an example of them. In the year-long nationwide dispute that followed, the media would play a pivotal role starting with Thatcher's allies in the press. The trade unions were operating in the 1980s against a backcloth of an unsympathetic press, and that's putting it mildly. The interests of the owners of the newspapers was themselves to limit the power of the trade unions. Before the 1980s, the, the print unions decided whether or not the newspapers came out, and the proprietors resented that. The miners' strike was defined by battles outside coal works between strikers trying to shut down production and the police. Police officers committed the worst of the violence, sometimes unprovoked. 
but it was the violence of Scargill strikers that dominated the headlines and produced a powerful media narrative of the miners as an angry mob and Scargill as a public enemy. What was so exceptional about the miners' strike was that we had a government that understood how to use the media. If you can use uh, uh, the newspapers to set up the agenda, this will also be reflected in what appears on radio and television. After two hours, the police were tired of being pushed and pelted with house bricks. The pickets knew what to expect. They'd been warned it could turn nasty, and it did. These were the strikers who were threatening law and order. These were the strikers who were the Marxists who wanted to bring down the government of the day. There was no doubt that Scargill was demonised to a degree that no other union leader has in my lifetime. To a certain extent, Scargill, Arthur Scargill, was his own worst enemy. To hell with an industry that can't pay high wages. He cast himself in a, in a very aggressive role, and that enabled the press to make him out as some sort of devil incarnate who was there to try to take the country down. I look back as a broadcaster, I was with the BBC, and I really realised that, although I was inadvertent, I'd become almost a cheerleader for Mrs Thatcher, because I was following her agenda. She was determined to get half the miners back at work and then she could declare victory, which she did. And it was done on the back of the news media. Britain's trade unions still live in the shadow cast by the Thatcher years. Fenced in by some of the strictest anti-strike laws in Europe, their membership has declined by half since their peak in the late 70s. The journalists who used to cover them, industrial correspondents, have all but vanished too, replaced by business reporters or generalists like the presenters Mick Lynch has faced, who are often better at generating heat for ratings and clicks than they are at shedding light. It makes me laugh, honestly, that you have the hood as your profile pic because that's a man who wreaked havoc on the world. Well, it makes me laugh that your level of journalism has descended so far that you can't think of any other question rather than a, a thing about... I'm here at the picket line for the latest rail strike in central London. It's the RMT's seventh strike so far this year. And I've come here to ask Mick Lynch how he sees the British media today compared to the days of Arthur Scargill. Well, back in those days, we had the uh, press, me the uh, newspaper media, and we had a couple of channels, BBC and ITV. But what we've got now is a, is a flourishing of outlets. There's lots of different digital channels, but also the social media channels, and it allows trade unionists to have more of a say. Whether it gets across or not is another way, because the written media is still a very important uh, aspect in this country. So you now have a lot more public support for your cause than you did at the time of the last strike. Do you secretly want to thank those TV presenters? Well, there's been a turn. I think what happens to those journalists, they weren't with it because they regurgitate the press releases that they get and a, an editorial line. It's changed, actually. In the last few weeks, some of those mainstream journalists have shown a bit more respect, frankly, and have been a bit more cynical about what they've been told by the government. And so we've seen a bit of a change of attitude, but we still have to work hard to find our voice. Get your members motivated. Mick Lynch's handling of the UK media has given the country's trade unions a boost as they continue their strikes. But like Arthur Scargill and the miners, Lynch, the RMT and the rest of Britain's unions face a Conservative government that is refusing to back down and has threatened another anti-union crackdown. It sets the stage for another conflict, one in which the media will once again be participants as well as observers.